Hello, I'm Adrian Steichen, Principal at Piatok Architecture and Urban Design. I also have the honor of serving as the AIA San Francisco 2020 President. It's my pleasure to welcome you to AIA San Francisco's 2020 Design Award celebration. We are so excited to recognize 22 fantastic projects representing the best of San Francisco Bay Area architecture and design. I'm glad that you've joined us for this special celebration in the midst of many challenges that this year has posed for our community. As you know, after initially being planned as an in-person event uh, with a gala reception, this program has been much delayed. We thank you for your patience as we've adapted to the pandemic to bring you our first ever online only design awards ceremony. Hello, I'm Stacey Williams, the executive director of AI San Francisco. I'm reporting to you from AISF headquarters on the sixth floor of the historic Halliday Building as we prepare to say farewell to this office after 32 years. A lot of work is going on behind the scenes at AISF as we pack up and prepare to move to our new home on the ground floor of the Halliday Building. Just as the AISF team has been tackling a number of unprecedented changes, adaptations, pivots, and challenges this year, we acknowledge that it's not business as usual for you out there in the community either. As the coronavirus and economic challenges continue, AISF is focused on our community's recovery, health, and collaborative spirit. Amidst the ongoing challenges facing us all, we are so happy that you can join us. In the face of so many challenges day to day, we are still inspired in this moment to consider the opportunities that we see this year, and indeed every year, as we look to the future of the profession. Ongoing conversations around equity in the built environment and the design profession serve as a reminder that the time is always now to work towards designing an equitable future and to stand in support of the black community in condemning systemic racism. We're actively confronting fundamental changes in the way that architects collaborate to work in person and online while tackling new challenges and achieving a work-life balance while working from home, and with a shift in the nature of responsibilities inherent in our personal lives like childcare and education. As our own workplaces become hybridized, we look forward to the evolving conversations around building safety and occupancy in the light of the pandemic, and to understanding how best to design hybrid environments. With a future focused on safety and equity, we have much to look forward to. In anticipation of our relocation next year, we're excited to invite you to join us for the design reveal of Aylan Darling's plan for AISF's new headquarters on Monday, November 16th at 11 a.m. This space is designed to celebrate San Francisco's pioneering and creative spirit while engaging our community and collaboratively building our future. Come see how Aylan Darling's conceptual approach captures AI San Francisco's vision as a visible, accessible, high-profile facility representing a vital role of architects and designers within the fabric of the built environment. The new design meets the goal to represent the forefront of design thinking, equity in the profession, and will be a model for sustainable design best practices. And it is a space that will serve as a hub for engaging professionals, students, and the public. Hand in hand with the opening, AI San Francisco has developed a momentous plan to grow educational and public programming to inform, inspire, educate, and engage our audience on the leadership of architecture and design industry in creating a more enjoyable, equitable, inclusive, and sustainable built environment. It has been a challenging year to launch the capital campaign that covers the renovation and opening of our new storefront space dedicated to architecture and design in the heart of downtown San Francisco. And we are so excited about all of the pro bono support that we have and hope to grow. I hope you will stay tuned in to AISF Communications for upcoming announcements on a competition to name this space that will house our chapter. Before we begin the awards presentation, we'd like to thank this year's jury who braved the onset of the pandemic and nobly convened at the AI San Francisco office the week before we were hit with the shelter in place order. Our fantastic jury members were Allison Arieff, celebrated design writer and formerly the editorial director at Spur and now senior editor at City Monitor. Tim Colvahouse, FAIA, 
who in addition to writing, specializes in helping fellow architects enrich their practices by sharing what they know. Sheila Kennedy, FAIA, Professor of Architecture at MIT and founding principal of KVA, Matt X, an interdisciplinary practice that is widely recognized for material research and innovation in architecture and the design of new infrastructure for emerging public needs. And Larry Scarpa, FAIA, founding principal of Brooks and Scarpa, recognized for his creative use of conventional materials in unique and unexpected ways, and as a pioneer and leader in the field of sustainable design. Thank you again to all of our wonderful jurors. Now on to the awards. The AI San Francisco Design Awards program was created to recognize projects that demonstrate overall excellence in architecture and design. In recognition of the importance of sustainable design, AI San Francisco instituted a separate awards category for energy and sustainability in 2003. Since then, the profession has transformed the way it designs, builds, and maintains buildings. The Design Awards program now incorporates the fulfillment of sustainable design principles into all categories. By introducing concentrations and commendations, AISF hopes to give special acknowledgement to elements of projects that further encompass the value of good design. It is our pleasure to welcome Manuelita Antonio to present the first commendation in the category of social responsibility. Manuelita is the founder and director of Superworks, a creative studio based in San Francisco that specializes in creating handsome digital environments for organizations and individuals ready to make an impact. She is also the One Plus Program Coordinator at Public Architecture. Hello, my name is Manuelita Antonio Rangel Sosa. I'm here today to present the Social Responsibility Awards. Um, but first, I just want to tell you a little bit about my story. I graduated with a master's in architecture uh, from La Universidad de los Andes in 2000. After going to Australia to study and coming back, my first job was to help create the Caracas Urban Think Tank in Universidad Central de Venezuela. Then six months into it, a coup d'etat happened and the university was closed. I found myself in the streets of San Francisco, walking around with my brother in Haight-Ashbury. I saw this sign that read, dishwasher needed, leave the American dream. And I was just, what have I gotten myself into? It wasn't easy to find work as a young foreign woman. Bill from William Stout gave me my first job. Uh, I stayed for half a decade. It was a great education. Then in 2015, John Peterson welcomed me into his office in Folsom Street, public architecture. There I had a desk. I also worked with Amy Ress on graphic design for public architecture. I worked with John and Tim Kova House uh, on the Cities Plus program. And since 2018, I've been coordinating the OnePlus program, which many of you probably are familiar with and participate on. Thank you. Uh, we match nonprofits with designers and architecture firms that are uh, getting engaged in pro bono work. It was there that I also laid the foundation for what today is my practice. Instead of building buildings, I built online environments. I am the founder of Superworks. The name was inspired by my heroes, the young architecture students that created the radical uh, architecture in Italy in the 60s, Super Studio. Why is this relevant? Well, just as the floods in Venice in 1966 were the catalyst for conceiving an alternative model for life on Earth, this year, 2020, this global pandemic feels very much like the catalyst for unprecedented change. As architects, the ones bestowed with the responsibility of the built environment, it is an incredible opportunity to devise alternative models, new ways to think about our work 
and who is this work for? Who is benefiting? We don't have the luxury to be utopian. At Superwork, we have a motto. Let's do work worth doing. This implies a set of questions. Is the work impacting a community in a positive way? It is solving a problem for many uh, or just a few? Is it adding to the common good? The common good, remember him? A concept similarly forgotten by today's media lexicon, it has regardless stayed alive and well in many circles of our profession. This, this, this social impact work, the pro bono work, the social responsibility projects are futuristic in a very different way than the Italian futurists were. We now know that the future is not about speed, cars, monuments. We understand we can't erase the past. A bright future lies in understanding our history, learning from it, caring for each other and the environment, and by lifting our communities and building a future in which equality, the real American dream, truly exists. To those already doing the work, I congratulate you. To the rest of us, I invite you to join this future, the sustainable one, the one the generations to come will be able to build on, not only survive in. And now, it's my honor to present the AIA Social Responsibility Awards. This convention acknowledges projects to enhance community and nonprofit organizations, particularly in underserved communities and recognizes the dedication of an architect's time and expertise to benefit those without the means to afford them. This award is presented in partnership with Public Architecture. Our first social responsibility commendation recognizes, let me see, TEF Design for Caliber Schools Change Makers Academy. Deliver on an extremely modest budget, the New Caliber Schools Change Makers Academy exploits color and subtle design strategies to transform an otherwise unconventional but banal tilt up concrete structure while leveraging its great potential as a community building agent. A fundamental way that architecture can be socially responsible is in the careful stewardship of the client's resources. The jury found that this imaginative use of tilt-up construction does just that. Congratulations, TEF Design. Bravo. Now, for the second responsibility commendation, it is now my pleasure to recognize John's high due for the Felipe Alou Baseball Academy. Since the 50s, Major League Baseball has worked to develop talent in Central and South America. Today, all Major League teams have established academies in the Dominican Republic for promising teenage players. The Giants have a long history in the Dominican Republic and wanted a facility reflecting their commitment to their country. This new training academy for the San Francisco Giants in the Dominican Republic creates a campus-like atmosphere with two main buildings focused on the playing fields, a dormitory and classroom building, and an athletic and administrative and administration building. The design responds to the environment through the use of ply roofs, narrow massing, and local materials. The jury loved this imaginative response to climate. Congratulations to this year's social responsibility commendations. Thank you. This year's next award is a commendation in historic preservation. The Historic Preservation Commendation acknowledges projects that have been restored, preserved, or rehabilitated as part of the San Francisco Bay Area's historical, architectural, and cultural heritage. This award is presented in partnership with SF Heritage. This year's Historic Preservation Commendation recognizes Marcy Wong Don Logan Architects for Uber Advanced Technologies Group R&D Center. Uber Advanced Technologies Group is a self-driving technologies engineering team whose R&D center is housed within historic Pier 70 in San Francisco. The center's four massive buildings, constructed between 1885 and 1937 for ship repair, now extend the site's legacy of transportation endeavors into the 21st century. 
The jury admired how this restrained reinhabitation contrasts sleek, minimalist insertions with the raw surfaces of an abandoned factory complex. The architects did a great job retaining the utter sublimity of the existing building. Congratulations. The next awards are in the unbuilt design category, recognizing architectural design work that, to date, remains unbuilt. Unbuilt architectural designs of any project type are eligible, including purely theoretical projects. Our first honoree receives a citation award. Congratulations to Fan Pan for Sublimity of Horror Architecture. Abandoned infrastructure embodies the beauty of humans' creation, which not only includes the embedded beauty of technology and history, but also the potential future functions of the structure and the inherent opportunities of reutilizing the strengths of the existing formal statement. The jury rejoiced at this appropriately wild and wacky repurposing of abandoned infrastructure, which recasts the beautiful but sinister hyperboloids of a decommissioned nuclear plant as a place for recreation, education, and research, and as symbols of a brighter future. We now welcome Fan Pan to say a few words about the project. Hi everyone, my name is Fan. I'm excited and honored to be recognized by AIASF with a citation award for my project, Sublimity of Horror Architecture. My intention for the project was to change the horrifying image of abandoned infrastructures to be public welcoming. Uh, my site locates on decommissioned Rancho Seco nuclear power plant. It is a good example of horror architecture when you think about it on a human-friendly scale its structures and forms that are solely designated to power generation and its man-made surrounding site. My experimental transformation aims to break down the machine scale and provide diverse programs with a focus on sustainable reuses which turned out to be quite well. And with the chance here, I'd like to say thank you to my professor, David Gill, to my parents and friends who supported me during my exploration. And at the end, I appreciate the recognition from AIASF and thank you everyone. Congratulations to Fan Pan. This year's second recognition in the unbuilt design category is a merit award to Jong Ok Kim for Bay Area Solar Transit Hub. Inhabitants of the Bay Area have the tremendous privilege of access to its incredible natural resources, with the Bay itself as one of the most important natural resources in the region. This thesis is a proposal for a new Bay Area Solar Transit Hub, or BAST, a zero-energy ferry transit center that has both social and environmental benefits. BAST takes net zero energy from the grid by harvesting solar energy through the photovoltaic arrays on the building's roof and using it to operate its electric ferry fleet. The building rests on a set of floating pontoon foundations as a solution to the threat of increased flooding events and sea level rise. The jury was struck by the boldness of this proposal for on-site generation of power. We now want to welcome Zhang Ok Kim to say a few words about the project. Hi, I'm Zhang Ok Kim. I'm incredibly honored to receive this award from AIASF. BAS was conceived as the final thesis project for my graduate degree in the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. I just finished my master's in architecture in May. So this award is a big boost of encouragement for me as I embark on taking the next step in my career as a new graduate designer, which is a bit overwhelming especially now in this time of uncertainty. I've always been drawn to the idea of sustainability, and I strongly believe that we are at a place where everyone needs to do more to mitigate climate change. So for my um, project BAST, it was very clear to me from the beginning that which approach you needed to take and that it must focus on sustainable design solutions. And um, as a new graduate designer, I look forward to working on more sustainable design focused projects and seeing them built in the real world. Thank you. Congratulations to Jong Ok Kim. 
This year's final recognition in the Unbuilt Design category is a Merit Award and Commendation in Urban Design. The Urban Design Commendation acknowledges projects that shape our physical setting. The Urban Design category seeks the most compelling work and ideas, both built and unbuilt, that confront and resolve environmental and urban challenges at a scale larger than that of an individual building. This commendation is presented in partnership with SPUR. We are pleased to award Kenta Oye for infilling the void. The thesis for this project finds its roots in the thesis that urban planning in San Francisco has confined ethnic neighborhoods into inhuman urban spaces. The design approach aims to nurture the uses of intimate streetscapes. The response is to pave an urban aperture, bridging market and mission streets as a continuous fabric revealing and reclaiming the lost layers of time. The jury loved the form of the project and the way that the building meets the street. There is great urbanism here, a refreshing change from stereotypical glass boxes and a compelling process of shaping the building form in response to the urban circumstance. We now welcome Kenta Oya to say a few words about his project. Hi, the project Infilling the Void was derived out of the byproduct of urban planning in San Francisco. The initial concept examined how the evolution of urban planning concealed ethnic communities in urban settings. Being of Japanese descent, I explored this notion through a cultural lens and discovered that my ancestors took root at what was considered the first Japan town in San Francisco. The site went through a gradual transformation and over time lost its rich identity as a thriving neighborhood. The design proposal reclaims the footprint of an old community center and points to a new urban corridor that connects Market Street and Mint Plaza. Nestled in between this new linkage is a cultural center that is inspired by the book, The Art of Gaman. This book houses a collection of artifacts that was curated during the Japanese internment camps. These artifacts are tangible proof of how this community endured the unbearable with patience and dignity through the process of making. This building will house a series of ceramic, wood, and sewing galleries and workshops that is linked by a communal atrium that invites the general public to create, congregate, and share their stories through the process of making. We will now present the awardees in the category of interior architecture, which recognizes excellence in this discipline. Our first honoree receives a citation award, Bolin Sawinski Jackson for Blue Bottle Stanford. The Blue Bottle Stanford Cafe occupies a long, narrow, and strikingly tall retail space. The design capitalizes upon these remarkable proportions of the interior volume using a series of sculptural folded vaults that emphasize the verticality of the space and bring abundant natural light into the cafe. The jury loved how the pyramidal vaults create a bright, lofty version of the cafe trope. Congratulations. The next citation in interior architecture is awarded to Gensler for Dandelion Chocolate Factory. Dandelion desired an understated design that evoked a warmth and genuineness with a crafted and exquisite atmosphere where customers can experience the making of chocolate firsthand. The project involves seamless insertion into a 107-year-old warehouse while maintaining the structure's integrity and highlighting the abundant, delightful natural light. The jury was wowed by the deft choreography of the visitor experience and the carefully developed vocabulary of materials and details. Congratulations. The final recognition in the interior architecture category is a merit award, once again, to Gensler for one Embarcadero Center lobby. To reinvigorate the entry experience of a historical resource office building, the updated design enlarges the lobby and strategically relocates existing circulation elements. Rather than burying the existing brutalist core, it is now the backdrop for a veil of dynamic white ribbons that create an area of repose. The jury appreciated this elegant softening of the Embarcadero Center's stern materiality. Congratulations to all of the honorees in the category of interior architecture. It is now my pleasure to welcome this year's keynote speaker, Larry Scarpa, founding principal of Brooks and Scarpa. Larry served on our jury this year and will share his insight and expertise to demystify the awards and jury process. Hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, 
I'm Larry Scarpa, principal at Brooks and Scarpa. I'm going to talk to you for briefly um, about design awards. So I'm going to try and do it all in five minutes in one take. So forgive me in advance for any faux pas and, and such. So um, design awards, um, most of us covet them. We know the importance of them. But what a lot of us don't know is what happens behind the scenes. Um, I've participated in hundreds of juries around the country and I've seen a lot. So hopefully I can give you a bit of advice that will help you win awards in the future. The first thing you need to know that design awards are in part subjective. So while each individual jury from year to year sets up criteria for what they think is important, it's still subjective. You, know, you have to think of it a bit like a love story. You can think of all the bad things about your uh, soulmate, but in the end, the heart wins. So you have to win the person's heart. In order to do that, you have to tell a story. And I think often the story are told uh, in words as opposed to in uh, drawings. And we are visual, so you have to be a visual storyteller. Uh, most uh, projects that win do a good job of that. And the ones that don't prevail um, do not. So it's really hard for a juror to understand a project, especially when they're looking at hundreds or even 40, 50, 30. So you have to be clear and tell your story. The best way to do that is through diagrams. And believe it or not, a lot of uh, submissions don't include good diagrams and that really helps the jury. Uh, you have to think about it like giving a test to the jury. Um, for example, um, you know, you give the test that you already know the answers to. So you ask the questions um, that you already have the answers. How you do that is in diagrams. Explain your concepts through diagrams, explain what's important. And I think if you can do that, it helps the jury understand your intentions and takes away a lot of the subjectivity to selecting an award. Um, so particularly when it comes down to someone advocating for your project and other jurors ask why, they can point to your diagrams and say this is what the designer's intentions are. Uh, another key thing, and this happens more often than you think, is that applicants put in too many pictures. Um, I've been on juries many times where we look at the first four or five pictures and go, wow, this is fantastic. And then after that, you know, you get to the 15th or 20 photo, it goes into the no award category. So it's better to just select the best handful of images and use those only. Let the jury fill in the blanks beyond that. Uh, we've given awards on the national level um, for some projects that have only had a handful of pictures. So let the jury fill in. Don't fill in with bad information. Um, that is really key to an award. You know, be brief, be succinct and you do not have to show everything. Just show the main parts because we go through it. I want to tell you a brief story about awards. Um, you know, I, early in my career, didn't submit for awards, and I think it was in part because I hate losing more than I like winning. And, um, you know, when I finally submitted for my first awards for the LA AIA Awards, I won, I believe, six awards that year. I kind of proverbially came out of nowhere, and Tom Bain came up to me and said, who are you? You know, where, where did all this come from? And I told him, I said, well, you know, I've been here, I just never submitted for awards because I hate losing more than I like winning and he said are you kidding me he said you just keep submitting till they relent so like if you lose an award it doesn't necessarily mean you're a loser um, 
uh, you just have to resubmit, you know, you have to make it clear. So every jury is different and even projects that we, that I've been on that we did not select one in subsequent years. I've submitted projects that didn't win uh, that later one. So you just gotta kinda try not to be dissuaded or feel bad about losing. It's, I know it's easy to say. Um, I still feel, you know, like I'm not, my work's not good when we don't get an award and I still try to put that behind me. So keep submitting the awards. I hope that helps and enjoy the program. Thank you. We will now announce this year's award recipients in the architecture category, which recognizes and celebrates outstanding achievements in architecture. The first citation award in the architecture category recognizes Aidlin Darling Design for High Desert Retreat. Sited on a rocky plateau outside of Palm Desert, this residence is nestled within a constellation of boulders overlooking the Coachella Valley and the San Jacinto mountain range. The home's diagram is a triptych of elements, a floating roof plane, a collection of wooden volumes, and two concrete anchor walls. The jury felt that every aspect of this home is perfectly executed and was amazed by the way that the canopy frames the sky above the pool to add new possibilities to the vocabulary. Congratulations. Our second citation award recognizing architectural excellence goes to Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and Mark Havanera Associates for Moscone Center Expansion. The Moscone Center Expansion transforms Northern California's largest convention center into a publicly spirited civic work of architecture. The traditional black box convention center is turned inside out using program, form, transparency, circulation, light, and landscape to connect visitors to the city and the neighborhood to the activity in the building. The jury was pleased with this handsome, responsibly urban, clearly navigable instance of an impossible building type, finding it to be a significant improvement over its predecessor. The project is especially successful at making the building meet the street and serves visitors and not the traffic whizzing by. The next citation award in architecture recognizes Stanley Sadowitz Natoma Architects for PG&E Petrero. The new Petrero PG&E substation building is set back 30 feet from the sidewalk, creating a public plaza. The 30-foot facade wall is elaborated with four-foot precast concrete bands unfolding onto the plaza, becoming seating and pedestals to invite habitation. At night, concealed LEDs illuminate the vertical and horizontal public surfaces. The jury admired this artful treatment of what would typically be an intrusive eyesore in the urban streetscape and asks to see more infrastructure as a bold architectural statement. Congratulations. Our next citation in architecture awards Mark Cavaniera Associates for the Bechtel Family Center for Ocean Education and Leadership for Monterey Bay Aquarium. With growing demand for its one-of-a-kind educational offerings, the Monterey Bay Aquarium spearheaded a new four-story education center along the historic Cannery Row. The facility, crafted with materials that respect the district's industrial history and vernacular, provides an immersive educational experience with STEM learning labs and live animal exhibits. The jury enjoyed the sophisticated contemporary rendering of the Cannery Row vernacular. Congratulations. Our next citation award in architecture recognizes Perkins & Will, formerly Fowl Long Architecture, for the McClintock Building Adaptive Reuse. The nearly century-old Jessica McClintock headquarters is converted from a former dress manufacturer to a production, distribution, and repair mixed-use facility. Totaling over 100,000 square feet, the facility offers innovative maker spaces and a communal central atrium to attract a diversity of industrial tenants to this creative workplace. The jury appreciated how the insertion of the glazed courtyard transforms the entire complex with crisp economy. It is a tasteful and elegant evolution. Congratulations. Our final citation award in architecture recognizes Marcy Wong Don Logan Architects for the Water Emergency Transportation Authority Richmond Ferry Terminal. Richmond's new ferry terminal provides crucial fast transportation from the East Bay to San Francisco. Designed to be an iconic element, it is architecturally contemporary while compatible with the neighboring historic Ford Assembly Building. 
The building provides passengers panoramic bay views, as well as protection from wind and rain. The jury admired this well-tuned, scale-defying addition to the Richmond waterfront. As ferries become a more essential part of our transportation network, gestures like this terrific one are all the more important. At night, a beacon. By day, a transformation of the cargo vernacular. Congratulations. It is now our pleasure to welcome a special guest to the program, architect and filmmaker Marcio Kogan. Marcio is the founding principal of Brazilian firm studio MK27. He was born in the chaotic city of Sao Paulo and worked as a movie director until after he shot his first feature in 1988. Then, bankrupt, had to content himself with being an architect. Still dabbling in film, Marcio joins us from his practice in Sao Paulo, where he will present a short video essay on his hometown. At a unique moment in history, when we find ourselves languishing at home with our travel plans frustrated, we invite you on a journey to Brazil as we welcome Marcio. Thank you, AIA San Francisco community, for the invitation. I would like to show you a bit of my chaotic city through a movie, which is, in fact, a letter to the mayor of Sao Paulo. To me, it's hard to find similarities between the two cities, but here is a good example of what shouldn't be done. Welcome to Sao Paulo. Dear Mayor, you may not believe this, but this is a love letter. Love for this ugly, polluted, very chaotic, very violent, disrespectful, and for some inexplicable reason, a city that we like. This image shows São Paulo a little over a hundred years ago, a monster created in only one century. With 20 million inhabitants in the entire metropolitan area, who usually spend a daily average of 1 hour and 44 minutes to get anywhere, have 7% of their lives confiscated. The subway network today has a total of 7-8 kilometers, an absolutely ridiculous number for the size of the city. Our politicians, in a visionary attitude, decided to invest heavily in the automobile industry and consequently in the building of bridges, viaducts and elevated roads. The good news is that we will always manage a creative solution to solve our problems. And we have created with this one of the greatest contributions of the contemporary city, a transport system never seen nor thought of before, the Fura Fila, kind of line cutter. All of the mayors have changed this denomination, but I like to call it by its original name. We chose some of our swing. It's not a, an LVT, a LGBT, nor is it a monorail, much less a tram train. The Fura Fila is simply a humble bus that gains superpowers when entering the lanes of circulation. Sensational. Neither can we leave out the buildings of the city that makes us feel as if we were anywhere in the world. With our various styles, from neoclassic, neo-French, Egyptian, Egyptian-French fusions, neo-zumbis, Mediterranean, light Mediterranean, chanfreus, and hundreds of others, we can easily have the experience of living in Paris, New York, Shanghai, or the Greek islands. Who else has this privilege? Downtown, there is even an older building for those who are worried about the Cold War, the difficult irradiation. Their names are always in French or in English, very chic. Recently, on an archaeological tour of the city, I found a Brazilian name, Dona Sinhazinha. I think its residents are embarrassed to say where they live. Don't miss the accessible sidewalks on some roads such as the very elegant Oscar Freire, where they got the execution of the tactile paving completely wrong. 
The blind are not a concern. In fact, no one is. I like walking and it's almost impossible to use this form of transport. After all, the city hall is not responsible for this. We have 2.88 square meters of per area per inhabitant of a minimum of 12 square meters recommended by the WHO. But we are arduously trying to improve these indexes with the new areas that recently appeared in Sao Paulo. Perfect for family picnics on Sundays. To finish a visit to my friend, the Silveiras, who have an interesting view of the Minhocan, kind of big war, as it's called. Built by eminent former mayor Paulo Maluf in 1970 and baptized Elevado Presidente Costa Silva in just honor of a former general president. It cuts through the city or even better, destroys the city in its 3.4 kilometers extension. It was built with the intention of relieving the traffic of the main routes, which couldn't be widened or driven. Thus, the solution was the construction of a parallel road to the system. Another tragic problem that must have generated magnificent emissions. Some of them. Our first award of merit in architecture is accompanied by an urban design commendation recognizing David Baker Architects for 855 Brannan. This modern mixed-use community interweaves high-density homes and diverse open space to maximize housing, create connections, and activate the edges of an underutilized city block. Two mid-block passageways establish a walkable scale and an inviting and surprising public redwood grove that provides a serene sanctuary for the bustling area. The jury commends the project for bringing desperately needed public open space into this painfully long south of market block. Retail spaces and residential stoops make for a lively streetscape. The composition and finishes of the facades further modulate the rhythm of the block. Congratulations. Our second merit award in architecture recognizes Open Scope Studio for Better Placed Forests. The pavilion sits on the crest of a wooded rise, framing a view towards the meadow below and marking the threshold of the visitor's journey into the forest's memorial groves. The standing seam cordon shell protects the redwood decks, fins, and paneling. The jury was stunned by such a lovely light-on-the-land structure. It is a quiet and absolutely perfect architectural solution that provides an elegantly modest entry to a sacred natural landscape. Congratulations. Our next merit award in architecture recognizes Iwamoto Scott Architecture for Goto House. Goto House is a 2,230 square foot second home in Napa County on a 95 acre off grid parcel overlooking Lake Berryessa. The main concept organizes four programmatic zones as individual simple boxes gathered around a rhombus shaped central courtyard and united together by the hexagonal roof sloping outward towards surrounding panoramic views. The jury praised this bold and geometric tour de force in the service of lived experience. There's an amazing dynamism to this house. Congratulations. Our next merit award in architecture recognizes TEF design for Larkin Street substation expansion. An expansion to an original 1962 electrical substation, this net zero energy targeted electrical switchgear building represents a couple of firsts in environmental stewardship. Its faceted facade, an abstraction of the city's power grid, and lush green wall lend welcome aesthetic relief to the otherwise gritty urban fabric of its surroundings. The jury was moved by the display of loving kindness and energy efficiency for a neglected building type. It is a distinctively sculptural contribution to an increasing number of examples of infrastructure as great architecture. Congratulations. Our final merit award in architecture recognizes EHDD for Lick Wilmerding High School Historic Renovation and Expansion. 
A private school with a public purpose, Lick Wilmerding High School is founded upon a legacy of serving and being enriched by students from all walks of life. This renovated historic classroom building celebrates the school's mission with a new entry, spaces for multidisciplinary learning, and a prominent center for civic engagement. The second floor addition gives the campus an urban scale and a handsome street presence. The jury mused, what student wouldn't feel lucky and inspired to be here? Lick's historic commitment to creativity and craft is expressed in a dramatically modern way. Congratulations. The first honor award in architecture recognizes WRNS Studio for SF State Mashouf Wellness Center. The Mashouf Wellness Center advances a holistic understanding of student success, making physical, social, and psychological well-being integral to academic achievement. Certified LEED Platinum, the MWC, is a model of sustainability in a building type that has historically consumed excessive energy and water. The jury was amazed by such an assured and inviting building, all the motivation anyone would ever need to go to the gym. Congratulations. Hello, I'm Mitch Fine with WRNS Studio, a partner and manager of this project. And on behalf of WRNS and our consultant team, I want to thank the AIASF for the honor of this award. And an honor it was to work on this project. The Mishuf Wellness Center was the first ground up building in 27 years on SF State's campus. So it was breaking new ground in many ways and really needed to be a high impact place for so many stakeholders, but particularly the students. This was a very student-centric design process with their voices driving so much of the decision-making. We heard from them uh, that they wanted something much more than just a place to shoot hoops and, and lift weights and swim laps. They wanted a new place that had a very strong sense of campus community, but while also promoting holistic wellness and well-being, not just physical. They wanted a building that was filled with with daylight, and so it was oriented and designed to leverage every possibility for natural light. We imagined with them what it would be like to move through the building, and so we aimed to keep it open and fluid and synergistic. Given the building's purpose of promoting health and encouraging healthy lifestyles for such a diverse student body, we felt the building really needed to be a model of wellness and inclusivity and sustainability itself. So the goal of achieving LEED Platinum came directly from this belief, uh, as well as the strong desires of the student body. I visit the building occasionally and I talk to the students and the number one answer I get when I ask them what they like most about the building, what they're most proud of actually has nothing to do with recreation. It's, it's the fact that the building was designed with sustainability in mind. Uh, the students take great pride that their campus cares about future generations and is a good steward of the environment. And, and that's very inspiring and encouraging for us to hear, uh, not only as architects, but also as members of society. So once again, thank you to the AISF for the honor of this award. And last but certainly not least, our final recognition of the year is another honor award in architecture. Congratulations to Mork Olness Architects for Shigard Huta. Shigard Huta is a site-specific response to its cultural landscape. The cabin, suspended by 45 columns, is covered with diagonal logs and a grass roof. The all-wood interior is organized by four frustum ceilings, and the main space opens to the surrounding nature through glass walls. The jury adored this handsome contemporary adaptation of traditional building principles with a plan that is both disciplined and comfortable while maximizing incredible vistas. It is an inventive, cozy, and cute cabin with an elegant use of inspired textures and materials. Congratulations. Morkolis Architects is delighted to win an honor award this year for our Shea Garden event. Thank you, A San Francisco. Let's go. We started the project as we often do, by exploring ways to relate to the existing topography, natural light exposure, and view, and so forth. The program for the building is a ski cabin for a family of four. As we explored several different strategies, um, we eventually settled on a simple form and configuration that we thought would best solve the challenges at hand. Located on a narrow but long lot uh, on a ridge top about uh, 3,000 feet above sea level, uh, the main challenge of the project was to take advantage of the views and particularly down into the valley floor 
and to the rear uh, with the high mountain tops in the marshland. The challenge was solved by, in a relatively simple solution by placing a hovering volume uh, above the existing grade uh, on 45 stilts uh, that raise the building in order not to damage any of the terrain and also give a higher vantage point to the various views. The plan is uh, a very simple orientation where uh, you have the circulation in the center with a view um, at each end of the hallway and each room was designed so that it could have a view add onto the landscape. Um, and the intention is as you walk up and down the house, you always have a view to the left and a view to the right. So you're always really connected to, to nature. Also at the same time, the intention was to create a very intimate cabin uh, through the rhythm of compressed and expansive spaces. Congratulations again to all of this year's recipients. We would like to take a moment for one final recognition this year. AISF sends our best wishes to Larry Scarpa, who is celebrating his birthday today. We're wishing him a happy one and would like to thank him again for his contributions to our Design Awards jury and program this year. As we finish this season, I would like to encourage you to watch out for upcoming online programming coming to AISF. Stay tuned for updates on our Community Alliance program on November 18th, featuring, featuring an exciting retrospective on our Community Alliance Awards with new conversations from a wonderful panel of past honorees. I would also like to invite you to our annual business meeting and member celebration to be held on December 3rd. Join us online as we celebrate this year's successes, share 2020 chapter business, honor this year's newly elected AISF fellows, launch our annual Small Firms Great Projects publication, and look ahead to new and exciting endeavors in 2021. We need the participation from you, our chapter members, for the election of our 2021 Board of Directors. Goodbye. We know that people are ready to get together and we want to do so safely. As we look forward to the full opening of our new headquarters next year, we'll continue our ongoing schedule of strong online events, begin offering hybrid program opportunities as reopenings permit, and host fun outdoor events like walking tours, and we can't wait for you to join us. In closing, I would like to congratulate this year's AIASF Design Award honorees one more time and say thank you to the AI San Francisco staff, to the production team behind this video, to our generous sponsors and partners, and to you, our wonderful community. It is thanks to all of you that we are able to come together to celebrate, and I take such pride in the resilience of our community. Here at AI San Francisco, we are wishing you a safe, healthy, and prosperous future and are looking forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.